Hello and welcome to the Two Man Power Trip of Wrestling. Your host, JP Jabaz, with me today. Very special guest. Now works for Wrestling Inc. He's a bit of a wrestling pundit. I know him as Music Man Matt. He does a ton of wrestling theme music, or he did. He also did a bunch of great podcasts. One of them actually hit number one on the charts. He is, of course, the Music Man himself, Matt Coon. Matt, welcome to Two Man Power Trip. How are you doing? I'm awesome, man. It's great to be here. Not only am I like a longtime fan of Two Man Power Trip, but you and I have a history. Like you're one of the first people that I've known in the wrestling business. I'd consider us friends. We've never done a show together, but we've seen each other all over the country. We've seen each other in L.A. We've seen each other in in uh, North Carolina. We've seen each other in New York. It's always good to see you, John. Uh, and oh, and I've seen you here in Richmond too, a, a few times, yep. Richmond, Virginia. So it is great to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Hey, no problem, no problem at all. When you think about it, though, uh, we've had a lot of beers together. If you think about that, so not had any shows, we did have some beers together. Absolutely, I, we had one in uh, in L.A. recently, and then once in a while, I'll have one with your brother and think it's you. <laughs> yeah, true, true. That that does happen when. You were, you know, doing stuff for the for the wrestling business. Now, back then, was completely different, right? I mean, you really weren't in necessarily. You were just doing like themes and stuff, right? Yeah, I was uh, producing for for a very brand new podcast called Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. It was brand new, and I was on the, uh, you know, at the very beginning there was four of us. It was Bruce Conrad, Dave Silva, and myself. And uh, it just took off like a rocket. Then, of course, started working with Tony Schiavone and a little bit with Eric Bischoff, just as the Conrad Empire grew. But back then, I think I just started with, um, I just started with Conrad, and I talked to you because you're doing something in Richmond, and you said, "Hey, can you give Jillian Hall a ride yes. to the show?" Yes. And I'm like, "Sure." And of course, if you remember, Jillian Hall had this like gimmick where she sang, and so I swear to God, I picked her up. And she blasted the music, and she was singing into her airbrush. And I'm like, is this real life? This is insanity. <laughs> She's doing her gimmick while you're driving her around. I mean, come on, is she crazy? It, it was it, it was insane. And uh, that was kind of my first, man, that might have been the first wrestler I really spent any time with was Jillian Hall on that particular time. Of course, we hung out that weekend. We got to know each other and became friends and hung out with Shane Douglas a lot, too. Of course, I think Arn was there and a couple other people, but things have certainly taken off from there, haven't they? Oh, big time, big time. And it's funny with you, I always think like, oh, it, when people like say stuff online, of like, oh, uh, you know, they talk shit online. I'm like, man, if they met him in person, I don't know if they say that because no one probably knows you're what, 6'6", 6'5", six, 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 and you're, you're a big guy. I, I'm I'm a big guy, I'm about 6'5", and I'm, I'm up, up around 400 pounds and uh, just uh, someone... You know, that's why uh, being big is, is a good thing. No one picks on you. No one starts fights with you. But in general, though, no one ever starts stuff in real life. Like, even if you get disagreements online, someone will be like, oh, my bad, man. We're cool or whatever. It's not just because I'm a big guy. It's just because, you know, Twitter Twitter's not real life. You know, uh, uh, wrestling uh, debates are fun and interesting. And, and I've kind of dialed that back a bit as well. But, you know, if someone talks crap, I'll talk crap back. But... I don't think I've ever had a negative in person, in real life experience with another wrestling fan. When you are going through the business, like going back there with Bruce, can you believe then? Because basically the podcast game didn't like explode. The business wasn't really booming back then either. Now, can you believe where we are in 2024 now with it just exploding? Well, that's how I found you guys, because you're one of the few, like you were a, a premier podcast. It was like Steve Austin and then you, and then there's a couple others, you know, and I was addicted to these podcasts because, you know, for a long time fan, there wasn't really anything where like, oh my God, you can hear Paul Orndorff talk about character. You can talk about, you can hear all these different things. And, and then now it became where Conrad kind of made what some people call the Conrad format of getting one guy sitting there for three hours talking about one subject and that blew up. You know, at first it was the personality interview, like um, what you guys did and what Steve Austin did, right? You'd have an interview, yep. you would talk for an hour and that kind of, you know, a lot of people started doing that. And then with the Conrad thing, everybody started doing that, including myself, whether with Russo, I did it with Russo, I did it with Robbie E. I did it with, uh, uh, Dax and of course William Regal, um, 
And, you know, it's interesting what's going to happen next, but absolutely, there was no way to tell that this podcast thing would play out. And also, no way to know that I would be podcasting. You know, it's like uh, I just did music. I never spoke publicly before. And Conrad, you know, I was at his house once, and he's like, you should do podcasts. And I was like, huh. And uh, the rest is history. Uh, some people would like to forget it, but it is history. Now, um, I believe Dax was number one at one point when he was when you guys were podcasting together. And I think Regal was number two at one point, right, as far as charts are concerned. Yeah, like it was a thing with Dax. Regal did really well. Um, you know, Regal wasn't really made for podcasting. He didn't like talking behind the scenes. But he had such a wealth of knowledge. And, you know, when he talked about something as simple as pins, and it's something that uh, informs my wrestling watching this very day, like you watch someone pin – somebody do they take their other arm and press down the shoulder are they trying to win the match it's something i watch every time if you watch moxley or wheeler yuda anybody in bcc or anybody that regal has a hand in you can see when they pin somebody they'll take the other hand and try to pin them down dax of course uh you know dax and i are dumb and so we just thought hey you know dax is someone who i became friends with who uh, dax harwood of course ftr um who I became friends with, we decided to do a podcast. And in our heads, there was no reason not to talk about everything. Like Dax and I are kind of both kind of from the streets and both not really afraid of anybody or anything. So we're thinking, hey, we can just talk about anything. There's nothing we can't talk about. Turns out there's a lot of stuff you're not supposed to talk about. And uh, that's kind of what made our podcast uh, go away in a sense is that it just created too much controversy it was too much of a headache for him compared to his wrestling career. And it, it was better for him and better for wrestling that it went away because I felt we were contributing to wrestling, the wrestling world in a negative way by bringing up a lot of stuff, but we just weren't afraid to talk about anything. When that happens with, with Dax, is that one of the things where it's like, okay, we'll do this over when your career is over. Is that like, like the thought process is like, this is too personal right now and creating too much controversy, even though controversy does sometimes create cash. Absolutely. You know, uh, we've talked about it many times that when he retires, we'll do this again. But, you know, in, in short, it's CM Punk, right? You know, the CM Punk thing had died down a little bit. Brawl out had happened. It was a few months past. CM Punk was out of sight, out of mind. We brought him back up again. And all of a sudden, everybody's talking about Punk again. And then Punk comes back. We start talking about, hey, at All In... We should, they should just do FTR and punk against the elite. Like, why not? You know, and apparently there were some people who did not like that being mentioned. You know, uh, I'm not saying Tony Khan, I'm saying other people in the organization. And it just led to just a lot of, uh, a, a lot of stuff that made Dax's life a little harder than it should be when my dude is just trying to be a great professional wrestler. He's not trying to be a political person. And if you listen to the podcast, he says nothing bad about anybody, whether it be the Bucks or Kenny or, of course, Punk or his friends. We, we kept things pretty positive. It wasn't that we said things we weren't supposed to say. It was that we talked about things maybe you weren't supposed to talk about. Gotcha. With that, though, he wanted to work with the – you know, Dax wanted Punk to work with them. Punk probably wanted to work with them because, you know, obviously he knows I'm not in this business to make friends. I'm in this business to make money. Wouldn't that have been an awesome money match? I mean, the money match and probably Punk versus Omega one on one is probably the top dream match that they could have had or money match that they could have had. It would have been amazing, but the resentments were so much. Now, I don't talk to Matt and Nick Jackson. I have had, mm, let's say, pleasant dealings with them. You know, uh, we, we got together in a very, uh, can't talk about it too much, but a very challenging thing a few years ago, um, when I played music with their dad, um, and they came out and they've always been very nice to me. I've never had any problem with them, but I think from their perspective, they just didn't want to work with punk because punk, you know, started a physical confrontation with them. That's their perspective. I'm not saying that's right. I'm not even saying I agree with that. Cause I'm not sure. I think it was just a fight. You get over fights, you work, you make business. But from their perspective, the company they started, the company that they put their blood and uh, you know their soul into, was being disruptive uh, by a physical encounter, and they weren't under any kind of obligation to work with someone like that. 
This is all conjecture. This is all assuming. You know, I do know they weren't going to work with them. That's a fact. And so if I'm not going to work with somebody, it's gonna, it's because I think they're an a-hole or, or I don't want to give them that credit. I don't want to give them that rub. I don't want to make someone else look good. And I'm guessing that's what it was. But as far as I know, Punk was willing to let bygones be bygones. But some people just, um, from their standpoint, from the fight, from the first brawl out fight, I think the resentments were there. And, and you can see now the resentments are there with uh, what we heard about Dana Massey leaving and about how she felt that's Matt's wife, who was the head of uh, merchandise for AW, that she felt that they, the company didn't support uh, her uh, or support the Bucks in that situation, which goes to show that there was a lot of resentment there. I hope they all work it out. I wish Punk would have worked out in AEW. It certainly probably would have been better for wrestling. Uh, but Punk in WWE is fun, too. Man, I was at the MSG show. Uh, at, oh, uh, wow. Really? Uh, for WWE, the holiday show for Punk. Whew. So when I initially looked at the tickets, I'm like, oh, I'll probably go Nakamura's fighting Cody. But I, you know, and I, I like MSG anyway. It's not that far of a drive. Sometimes traffic sucks, but it's not that far of a drive for me to Jersey to get there. So I'm like, oh, Cody's on there. You know, maybe I'll go to the holiday show. It's I'm off for that week. I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll just go. So 11,000 seats. OK, all right. That's not bad. Then all of a sudden they announce Punk and then it's 16,000 seats and the price gets jacked up. So I was like, oh, shit. But I actually ended up paying decent price my friend who is in the section above me paid triple the price that i paid so just go show you punk equals business he's a draw i mean that losing him sucks i mean that that's just no other way to put it there's a lot of veteran moves as you know involved in buying tickets for shows like there's yeah. there's many you know waiting to the last second seems risky but usually financially is usually the deal right like mm -hmm. usually if you want to get stub hub you wait to that last second somebody's got tickets now once in a while that will kill you once in a while you won't get in once in a long while but generally that's the way to do it um punk leaving aw was a killer and you know i don't know the whole story one thing is dax and i are friends we're close but people don't believe this but i've never once asked him about punk um off air because I know one of the most obnoxious things to him is, you know, like journalists ringing him up and being like, hey, dude, what happened with your friend? And I don't want to be that kind of friend to him. I don't want to be someone who's just kind of rumor mongering. But I will say that I believe Tony Khan felt he had no choice. It certainly seemed like an untenable situation, even before the Jungle Boy thing happened, where you've got two shows but they still have to be in the same building sometimes. Some guys won't work with the one guy. And CM Punk is still taking shots. God bless Phil. But CM Punk is still taking shots like left and right at these guys. And um, and they're the guys who started the company. So, you know, it seemed like there was no way this would last. And uh, the Jungle Boy thing kind of kind of showed that. There, there was no way that was going to work with Collision and um, Dynamite being separate shows when they still had to work some shows together. It, it seems like if you can't work this out, somebody had to go. It's just crazy to think that he's gone. Not only is he gone, two months later, he's in WWE at Survivor Series, getting one of the loudest pops I've ever heard. His merch is like the number one seller. Then the MSG thing happens. It's the highest grossing thing. So it's almost like immediate bad karma like for AEW and immediate good karma WWE. it's like holy shit this hogan bruno uh rock austin they're all at the garden they're all these years this guy comes in i know inflation everything else is up but still this guy comes in the garden and ex explodes the business man the merch stand even looked like it was ransacked like when i went up to it it was just it was crazy how many people were just buying stuff it was also a timing thing. Like, you know, CM Punk goes to WWE at the time and point where WWE is hotter than it's been in decades. Yep. You know, so you're adding the hottest guy off the hottest controversy maybe since the 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 um the Montreal screw job coming in at a time where, you know, Triple H is on just he's killing it and 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 when you look at the, what's going on, people talk about booking, booking, booking. But I think about characters, characters, characters. When you look at what Triple H has done, everybody is a bigger star than they were a year ago. Everybody's more compelling than they were a year ago. You look at a Drew McIntyre. What was he doing a year ago? Right now, I'm, I'm looking forward. Look at what they did with Jay Uso. Like, who saw that coming? Cody Rhodes 
How in the heck did Cody Rhodes keep his momentum for a full year after somehow losing? So it, it is booking, but it's more about how hot they are because everybody wants to see all their wrestlers. They have like 10, 11 guys that if they headlined a house show, you'd be happy to see. True. And this was perfect too, because he hadn't been in the garden in 10 years either. So it was like literally perfect. They were clamoring for his return, but I just couldn't believe how much money they made on the house show. And I couldn't believe how much money, to be honest, my buddy spent on the ticket either, but I was like, Holy crap. Like that is just amazing that punk could do that and pull that off. Considering take all the other names before him, just it, it, perfect storm. And they're maximizing their profit point too. Like they know exactly how many tickets to sell at what price point to do it at. Like they're really optimized right now. You know, like we keep hearing WWE is, uh, has the biggest house they've ever had here. Biggest house they've ever had there. A lot of that is just pure metrics and figuring out how much can we get out of each customer for each seat. And they're doing that really well. And that's something AEW has struggled with. And I just can't believe like people would pay that much for a house show. You know what I mean? Like I'd pay that much for Mania for a ticket, but they're paying that for a house show at MSG. Crazy. I don't know, man. Like if Punk returned, I'd pay like I don't know, two hundred bucks to go see him. Maybe you know, like maybe more. I don't know. Like Punk against Dominic. After I mean, that's crazy. That's his first match back in WWE in ten years, and like and and the Garden is cool too. It's a little tight. It's a little small. You know, I'm a big guy, but um. Uh, it's a great place to see a show, and it is the Mecca. Like, you go there, and you're like, well, that's where, you know, that's where uh, Lou Albano got the got the big record smashed over his head, right there in the middle of the ring, you know. That's where all this stuff happens. So, man, you know, I think it's, it's a no-brainer. You got to go. You got to spend the money. You only get these moments once in a while, and the wrestling events that I'm glad I went to aren't the ones that had the greatest matches. They're the ones that had the greatest moments. I saw Seth cash in on Brock and Roman. It was amazing. I saw Bailey versus Sasha in person. That was amazing. It's these, uh, I saw John Moxley enter at double or nothing in Vegas across from me. Those moments are priceless. And that's why we go to wrestling shows. I agree. And I remember that for a long time that I saw the punker there. Cause that was awesome because he's not wrestling on TV. Like he did in a W. I love that. It's the Kia forum. It's MSG. It's Royal rumble. It's special occasions, which I think maximizes punker. It's so smart, too, when you think about it. Like, that's very much the old school, like how you and I grew up. You know, we saw Hogan wrestle Rusty Brooks on television, maybe. Like, once a year, Hogan would wrestle, or you would see something from the Garden or, or uh, like, Boston Garden or something. But for the most part, you would see the promos at the bumpers at the end of every segment going, Hogan's going to actually fight Paul Orndorff at the L.A. Sports Arena this month. And and so that's it's kind of the way it used to be in a lot of ways where they used punk to to bring up their house show. I love it personally. I don't think that's where they're going. I think all the money is in um, you know, is in streaming and TV deals. But I personally love the idea of of having matches and house shows. Even back in the day, I saw, you know, like Taker against uh, HBK at a house show. It's not something you'd see on TV, but it's a special it's a way they get you out to the stadium, you know, and seeing Dom against CM Punk. Where the hell else are you going to see that except the Kia Forum or Madison Square Garden? Pretty amazing. Right now with Punk, uh, Cody, Drew is now in the Rumble, Lashley, Nakamura. They're kind of stacking up the Rumble. Is there any way Punk doesn't win the Rumble? Because it seems like he has to, no? It seems like Punk or Cody, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think, so the Rumble's before the Elimination Chamber, right? Yep. So... If if Cody wins it, they ain't putting Punk in the Elimination Chamber. So uh, Punk has to win the Elimination Chamber, or he has to win the Royal Rumble. Absolutely, yeah. Punk wins that. I'll go ahead and give give you the predictions right here. Rock and uh, and Roman is definitely happening in Elimination Chamber. I am a hundred percent sure about that. And that uh, I'm not, you know, you can agree with it or not, but it does make Cody Roman kind of a bigger match now. If you treat that as kind of the 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 first match, you know, Roman beats Rock. Rock is one and out, and then you have Cody versus Roman at WrestleMania. Punk wins, likely gets the challenge against the other champion against Seth Rollins. That seems to be where we're going. It's logical, it's predictable, but man, is it going to be cool? 
looking at Roman Reigns just for a second and like his bookings, he obviously card subject to change, not booked for the elimination chamber as of yet, oddly enough, not on the poster, not booked for it. Kind of weird, right? Yeah, I'm looking for um, Rock and Roman at Elimination Chamber. Um, they are a couple reasons, you know. One is um, I kind of kind of heard <laughs> that that's what's going on, and second of all, I think that with these um, international PLEs, they're trying to make these a big deal. WrestleMania sold; it is sold, and this is not the Vince McMahon days where we have a lot of sentimentality towards things like WrestleMania. This is about bottom line stuff, the Nick Khan era. It's a Triple H era, but it's a Nick Khan era. And so we're looking at getting these international PLEs. We got Australia. We got stuff going all over the all over the world this year, the secondary PLEs, and they're trying to bring these up and create an international market. So uh, it's a hell of a way to do it, Rock and um rock and roman but i believe that's what's happening i believe that's what's going to be announced um otherwise uh, nothing else really makes sense i don't think when you look at that obviously australia france germany they're doing that why not wrestlemania though for rock roman it's the two biggest names you could put on a wrestlemania headliner i know you're saying it's more bottom line though that doesn't matter as far as right name. that's that's you know, for me, if it was me, I would put Rock. Well, no, no, because I'm a Cody guy. So I would, I hate Cody not getting his moment. I love Cody Rhodes personally and professionally. And I know when he went to WWE, when he signed with WWE, one of the things that he wanted was that title. Like, guys don't sign with WWE for titles, they don't sign for, like, I want this belt. Cody Rhodes definitely did. Cody Rhodes owns the belt that his dad lost at Madison Square Garden. Uh, Dan Labbert gifted it to him, the old WWE belt. Um, he owns that belt, and he wants to win that title, which is Roman Reigns' title. Um, I don't think he has to win it at Mania, but he wants that. So I'm, I'm a Cody guy. I think, you know, with The Rock, it certainly makes sense to do that at WrestleMania. I would probably put it WrestleMania, just at sentimentality. But bottom line, WrestleMania is sold. You're gonna have two nights, and you're gonna have CM Punk. It's gonna be, it's gonna sell out two two nights in a row easily. So right now, you know, I understand the viewpoint of doing of doing that. I believe that's what's gonna happen. It might be a timing thing with The Rock, but also the idea that Cody lost last year, and they Triple H is known for sticking with his um, sticking with his plan. And I think even though last year's plan was changed, I believe, because Vince was involved, you know, if you look at the, you know, look at the fallout of Cody losing, you had Roman Reigns off TV coming back and doing tags. You had Cody Rhodes doing matches with Brock Lesnar. It seems to me that was all kind of designed for Cody to have the title. But with Vince not in there anymore, I think it's a long-term plan that they said, okay, you're going to get it this year. You know, this is the year, and it's got to be at Mania because Cody is doing such great work on the house show circuit. He's being people's best men. He's he's <laughs> picking people off of Twitter to hand out belts to. Bro, I saw Cody. I mean, this is a different guy. Like, I've known Cody off and on for a few years, and we're friendly. And, like, I went to a house show here in Virginia. Cody stayed an hour afterwards and signed autographs for anybody who wanted him around the ring. There's a little kid that was close to me who was kind of mashed against the grid, who was crying. Cody lifted him up and put him in his arms, you know, and held him. And like Cody's going through tables like every single night in these house shows, he's doing, he's wrestling so many matches. I think it's just dumb if they don't make him the guy. He's the face of the company they've wanted for so long, and he's a guy that people are not cheering ironically like they did Cena. And also, while he was hot before, this last year of doing the work that he does has made him very beloved to the WWE. So I think that WWE is looking forward. You know, with The Rock, that's the ending. With Cody, it's looking forward. And then you can have the bloodline thing. Cody wins, then the bloodline explodes. Then you have these matches with Solo Sokoa and Jimmy, and maybe Jay gets involved. You know, but I think it's all about Cody. And I think it was set up a long time ago, uh, a, a year ago when Cody lost at Mania. 
when you look at Roman Reigns and the title run, does the number of days matter? Because they bring it up five times every time he's on TV. They, and for some reason, now Backlund has been erased. I don't know why. They stop mentioning Backlund. They they go, he's he's away from history. Two guys, Bruno Sammartino and Hulk Hogan. And they keep mentioning that. So does the day of the reign matter? Because he's at 1,200 plus now, and obviously Hogan's 1,474. Does that matter or no? Like literally nothing matters less, right? To me, it's a great thing to say. Like it, it, it looks. I remember. I think they really started doing this during the CM Punk run, when CM Punk won the title, and like you know, poor Punk. Like you know, he's always feeling like he's victimized. This was a good example of it. CM Punk is not headlining any show ever as he's champion. It's all about The Rock yeah. and John Cena, yeah. and but they are counting the days. They are saying, "Wow, he's been a champion for this amount of days and that amount of days." And as Brock became champion and they kind of lessened the importance of him showing up more and more, and now Reigns, who has just, you know, really taken this idea of very rarely wrestling to a to a new thing, it doesn't matter at all. It doesn't matter to the fans. It doesn't matter to me. It probably matters to Vince, who's not there anymore. So I would guess they're not going to really worry about breaking the Hogan record or the San Martino record. And of course, Backlund had that had that title forever, man. But, you know, I guess people don't want to remember the days that people are winning matches with atomic drops. <laughs> it's just weird that they mentioned Backlund like crazy. They were they were talking about Pedro Morales, then he beat Pedro, and so they stopped talking about Pedro. Then they were talking about Backlund, and then all of a sudden recently they stopped talking about Backlund. I don't know why, but they just kind of erased him uh, from history, I guess, so he could just focus on, on – on Hogan and Bruno, but just to me, it just seems crazy that they keep talking about the numbers. Like, oh my God, is he going to hold the belt for five more years? Be Bruno? <laughs> That'd be crazy. I am so old that Backlund is my first champion. And just briefly, when I started watching wrestling, it was right before Sheik got the title. So Backlund was that first champion I saw. And you know how it is. Like, you know, like the first music you ever, you ever listened to is the best music you ever heard, you know? Mm -hmm. And so to me, Backlund, you know, is the man, you know? I'm like, when's he going to get his shot? And I waited like 10 years, although it seemed like 100 years, didn't it, before he came back, you know? Yep. But yeah, Backlund deserves that. Backlund was, you know, he was handpicked to be kind of the opposite of like uh, Superstar Billy Graham and to be like this uh, clean cut, you know, you know, like the face of the company, you know, and he just didn't really have the charisma, you know, but um, they certainly found it with Hogan. Oh, in spades, maybe the most charismatic ever. When I was born, back when I was a champion, when, when I was, you know, um, I guess with it, if you will, Hogan is the champ. So that's when I first got into it, got the LJN. And I'm like, oh, my God. And then Hogan became a god, basically. You know, he was like the real life superhero to me. It's really funny when you think about it. It seems like those years stretched out for a decade, but it's just such a short period of time, you know, like yep. WrestleMania one through WrestleMania four or three or four, right. Where, where Hogan was just dominant, you know, and then gets it back from Savage. And, you know, to me, that seemed like it lasted like 20 years, you know, that Hogan was on top, but we look at it now, like that's less of a time than Tyler Bate was in developmental system. Like it's not <laughs> it's really, crazy, yeah. yeah. Time just is a strange thing. And then, Watching all these older wrestlers wrestle now is insane. Like, you know, like AJ Styles is older than Hogan was when he was in the NWO. Like, that's insane to me. Man, it's, and like Edge looks amazing, and he's 50. Christian is 50. He looks good. You know, it's like, what the hell? All these guys are that old, but they look like, you know, like, I don't know, 15 years younger than what they really are. It's crazy. Like, Rock and Roll Express were in their 30s when they were doing Smoky Mountain. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Horrible. Like, when they yeah. showed up on Raw, for that NWA thing, which actually I kind of thought could have hit and could have been cool, uh, you know, because you know you got some cool guys in there. But they were like not even forty when they did. I think Ricky's a little bit older than Robert, although you wouldn't know it from seeing him now. But um, yeah, <laughs> you know, sure. uh, Rick, yeah. Ricky looks great. You know, Ricky <laughs> Ricky looks great. But um, you know, it's it's insane when you see the average age of the effective wrestler. And I think that is something that WB, that AEW has is they do have a lot of really good young, young like real, like actually young wrestlers from Sammy Guevara to, to MJF, you know, Darby Allen, really good wrestlers. If they can hold on to them are going to be a, a big part of wrestling future. Now I know, um, 
your longtime close personal friend Disco Inferno did get in trouble for saying that AEW needed a reboot. But I just saw Jim Ross said the same thing. And obviously, I don't think anybody's going to say anything to Jim Ross. But what do you think? Do, you, do they need a creative, quote unquote, reboot or no? Well, Jim Ross just doesn't give a crap. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Jim Jim Ross don't care, man. He will just say yeah. anything. He's, you know, either his contract's up or his contract's been resigned, but he just doesn't care. Now, the thing with Disco, you know, the reason why Tony Khan got on Disco about that is that in, in Disco, we we cool. I blocked him just because of some other stuff, but we if I ran into him, we were cool. But like, you know, Disco's been a hater on AEW from the very beginning. Like, you know, like Vince, you know, or, or Russo. It, it doesn't have a lot of credibility when you hated them from before they started. You know, um, <laughs> here's right. the thing though. AEW has done a bit of a reset. They have <clears throat> putting, you know, MJF didn't wrestle even as champion on their show ever. And then he's wrestling all the time. He's appearing in all kinds of segments. Uh, they do the continental classic and they, they, you know, there was a time where they were doing these really corny, uh, you know, bits and these corny angles. So they are doing a bit of a reset. They did it. They started like maybe two or three months ago. And I think people just haven't noticed. Now, is that going to be enough to 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 really, um, you know, make an impact? We'll see. But what we don't need is like some kind of overt, obvious reset that has never worked in the history of wrestling. You know, like when Russo was at WCW, we saw it once with the with the with the Russo Bischoff show, New Blood, yeah, and, it, and then we saw it again. And then we saw it again. And then we said, this company sucks. We need to do this. Like, you only get really one of those, you know? And so they had to be very careful. I think right now what uh, AEW needs to do is keep solidifying their base, uh, you know, making sure they don't lose their base, which I think the Continental Classic was important for, so they can keep that number that keeps them going, but also figure out how to draw on those new fans, how to, you know... Um, Orange Cassidy is very popular with the kids. Uh, Dan Housen is very popular with the kids. Female wrestlers are a big draw for kids. We have to understand something. Tony Khan forgets this. WWE forgets this. Go to any wrestling fan and say, when did you become a fan? When did wrestling capture you for life as a fan? We are kids. All of us were kids. Now, yep. if you, as somebody who works with kids, if you try to market to kids and insult their intelligence... It ain't gonna happen. But if you put on kind of an edgy, cool product that will appeal to kids, that's the key. I remember going to NXT Black and Gold, you know, a lot. I love that. I love that era a lot. But I remember looking around those shows, those takeovers being like, where are the kids? There's not a single child here, you know? And so I think appealing to the kids is is how they need to do it, you know, and that's every wrestling company. If you you know, they're there ain't one wrestling company that's going to draw on adults. It only happened during the Attitude Era, and it happened among young adults and older teenagers. You got to draw on those kids by making cool people look cool. People look like superheroes. People have, and nowadays, fun, exciting matches. But, you know, like someone like Sasha Banks, you present her like a star. You present her, here's the template. I know I'm talking a lot. But the template is Cody Rhodes. The way that Cody Rhodes was debuted in WWE, my God, perfection, perfection. That's what they need to do with Sasha. That's what AEW needs to do all together. Like I said, I think not so much a reset as who are we trying to get watch TV? Who are we trying to get to watch this? Because capturing kids, we don't all stay. Like there's a few of us weirdos like you and me, John, that stay forever, right? Okay. They stay yep. forever. But for the most part, we're all captured as kids. I know probably three or four people of all the fans I know that started watching as adults. That is so true. I mean, I've been watching since the mid '80s, early '80s. I've been watching. I mean, Jesus Christ, and and been watching ever since. But you're right; you got to catch them younger and then keep them. Like Attitude Era was was where, where I was loving it because I loved Hogan. Then now I love Austin, and then I get some of my friends who don't even like wrestling. Like, hey, this guy's giving the middle finger and saying "suck it," and. You know what I mean? You got Sable over here, and you got China, and this and that, and then they get into it too. But they didn't watch when they were they, when they were younger. Yeah, their kids doing crotch chops at school. Um, <clears throat> Austin three sixteen takes off as a t shirt. You made it cool. Yep. WWE is hot right now. They're they're a spectacle like a circus, but they're not cool. A you know like it's not like people are bragging they watch wrestling. 
But AEW, any organization, has the ability to be cool if they want to. Darby Allen is someone with the kids I work with, he would definitely appeal to like teenagers and young kids. This dude's psychotic. He's 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 a uh, disturbed. He's probably on the same kind of like ADD and depression medicine that all kids are on these days. Like he's going to appeal to the masses. You know, he's going to appeal to these kids. I think, you know, WWE could do it too, but they don't like to do those kind of, you know, real 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 characters. AEW could definitely do that. You know, they have the people to do it if they wanted to. I like Darby Allen. He is the Jeff Hardy to me, like the new age Jeff Hardy. When Jeff Hardy was coming up and he, you know, all the girls are screaming, he takes off his shirt, they go nuts. But he's also a daredevil, so he attracts the male fan and the younger fans because they look up to him like, man, this guy is cool. He's not big. He's my size you know, or whatever, but but he can fight anybody because he's fearless. I like Darby. He's got, and he's got a cool gimmick, too. He's, he's different. Yeah, he is who he is. You know, he's he's psychotic. Like, you know, like he's like, man, he's like Jeff Hardy with worse decision making. You know, like he's just, <laughs> yeah. man, some of the jump stuff. Off he, this. Like, yeah. Every time I see Darby wrestle, I say, please don't do that anymore, Darby. Like, I've gotten old enough. I'll say it on this show. I'm 51. I know I don't look 51, but I'm 51. So I'm a little bit older. And as I get older, I watch wrestling. I just don't want him to get hurt. Like, I don't want these guys to get hurt. I used to love the violence, and I still love the violence. But some of the stuff I see Darby do, I'm just like, man, I really hate to see it. Like, <laughs> I talked to a friend of mine. You may know him. His name's Nick Gage. You know Nick, right? Oh, so yeah. Nick is someone I have tremendous affection for personally. I like Nick a lot. I can't watch his matches. I can't watch him. Because the glass and the getting cut, Mance Warner too, same deal. I can't watch Joey too, Joey Janela too. These are people that I'm friends with that I have great affection for. As I get older, I just don't like seeing them get hurt. But Darby is hurting the inside of his body. And I know there's no stopping him, but I wish there was some kind of slowing him down. With AEW, like obviously Darby is good and they have some good talent. And I'm saying like reboot and stuff, but do you think creatively Tony could use like somebody, maybe not Bischoff, but like a, a Bischoff type or um, or like a Sullivan type, a Kevin Sullivan type, like somebody like that that had the experience that went through the wars that would be like his right hand man or something in creative? Or, or do you think that he's doing OK? Here's the thing with that. It's it's I don't think it's one or the other. Like this is OK, so. I have a music school, and my music school, I started with my bare hands. I, like, built the walls, and I there's a stage outside. I built it. I did 100-hour weeks every week for years. I don't do them anymore, but for years, like, like five years, my entire life was a school. Once in a while, someone will come up with an idea, and I'll be like, shut up. You don't get to say the idea because I did the work. And I feel a little bit that way about Tony Khan. Like, it's his company. You know, it's his company, and you'd say, okay, you're not good at the fun thing, so you don't get to do the fun thing. You're not good at the fun thing the way I think you should be good at the fun thing, which is booking. That's the fun part. That's why he does this. Like, Tony Khan did E-Feds when he was a kid. Like, this is what – he didn't get into this to hand off booking to somebody else. And if he ultimately fails as a result, he's the one who takes the financial brunt. Like, it's his company. And I think people lose sight of that. What people get all involved in is like, well, he's a billionaire's kid. Play yeah, that's not his fault, guys. He was born in that situation. I wasn't. You weren't. That's not his fault. We can't hate him for that. But would I enjoy AEW better if it had storylines that I liked more? Yes. Yes, I enjoy things I like more than things I don't like. But can I tell this guy who has made this thing his life. Like, Tony Khan ain't no figurehead. He's a guy who puts in hundreds of hours, just hundreds of hours his entire life. He is a billionaire's kid, and he could literally sit on the beach with his America's Top Model girlfriend and do nothing all day long. But instead, he goes, you know what would be cool? What if we got Muda and Sting on this rampage? You know what I'm saying? Like... <laughs> We should appreciate him more. I'm trying to do that on my criticism online, honestly, because I get that whole mode, too, where I go, well, 
why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? I do that too. But the dude like put in the work, put in the, puts in the work all the time. And by the way, got a TV deal. Like the, do you know how hard it is to get a TV deal? People, TNA never got a TV deal. <laughs> TNA tried for 20 years. This dude got a T- TV deal. He didn't get it because he's Tony Khan billionaire's son. It might have given some inroads, but he worked towards it. So in short, what I'm saying is I think the booking could be more curtailed to what I would like. But who are we to tell this guy of this company that's winning Wednesday nights very frequently, getting 100,000 pay-per-view buys, filling a stadium of 80,000 that you can't do the fun thing? Let him. It's, it's his company. If it fails, it fails, you know? Hey, that generational wealth and wrestling thing does actually work, believe it or not. Uh, the, there's another company out there, same kind of kind of deal. Yeah, I mean, Vince did not earn the money. Like the the Vince McMahon le- the myth, you know, of like, yeah. you know, he paid his dad. He, you know, this is a great. He paid his dad out of his own pocket. Where does a where does a thirty year old get a million dollars in nineteen eighty three? You know, what I'm saying like you get it from your dad. You know, like you get it. It's, it's generational wealth. I was not born rich, but so many people, like if you take the Tony Khan criticisms and you cut out all of the billionaire son stuff, you'll probably get down to about 20%. Like it's literally 80% of people who wishes they were born in that situation and are jealous of the fact they weren't. And, you know, you should, you should book this so I will enjoy it. You know, it's the Cornette thing. Where if wrestling is not this way, then it's bad. If wrestling is not this, Russo too, a lot of us, Meltzer too. If wrestling is not this way, it's bad. Well, this guy, it's his money, it's his company. He gets to decide what to do. And 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 I myself am trying to dial back my criticism a little bit of the booking. And I never say he should get somebody to help or anything like that. Because I get wanting to do the fun stuff. Are you worried about the ratings at all for AEW right now? You know, um, I think there is a duality here of thought. You know, uh, Tony Khan sometimes lives in, uh, you know, positive land of going, well, look at this thing and look at that thing and look at that thing. Everything's going great. But I think we can honestly say that four years ago, he didn't see the ratings being where they are right now. He saw them being higher. I would guarantee that. You know, so uh, they should be higher. They could be higher. Do they need to be higher? I don't think so. I think um, we've seen like the ratings for AW have diminished about the same rate of uh, the amount of cable homes being lost. Right. Yeah. So it's yep. basically the same as it was. Again, let's be intellectually honest. Is that ideal? No. Is that what we want? No. Is NXT going up? Yeah. So it's possible. Uh, I hope so. Like, I I remember, you know, I'll say this here is that I had a tweet that went viral because I heard about the WBD thing. You know, like I heard people talking um, that, that, um, a, that WWE were talking WBD. And I wrote on Twitter, I'm like, no, they're not. That's stupid. There's no chance. And I get a text that said, uh, yeah, yeah, they are. And they met. You know, they met the day after Survivor Series and they met the day before the tweet I sent. And I was like, oh, 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 oh my. <laughs> okay. So I, I tweeted, hey, people are going to go crazy when they find out. And that tweet blew up and people are like vague tweeting. But I would hate for WBD to be taken out from under Tony. I also heard that there's been an offer from um, WBD that's been sitting with Tony for a while. That's what I heard. And that he just hasn't signed that offer yet. I don't know if he's lost leverage or gained leverage. Um, but I think, you know, Punk was a factor. Punk was a factor. If they met the day after Survivor Series, which is what I heard, that means that Triple H knew, Nick Khan knew that Punk was coming in, CM Punk knew he was coming in, and probably David Zasloff knew that Punk was coming in yes. uh, that Sunday if they met Monday. So, you know, it, 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 Tony Khan did not deserve that. I'll say that much. I think I'm, I get it with CM Punk. I get it like if I'm going to destroy my enemies, I'll burn down the whole world. But 
Man, uh, it, I hope he doesn't lose WBD. Are the ratings strong enough where if he loses WBD, they're in a strong position? Probably not. But are they in a dire position? Probably not. The thing is, too, that would suck. It's almost like the same thing that happened to WCW. WCW got hot. The NWO, they got good. WWF, like, kicked it into gear. They really elevated. WWE was terrible for, like, 20 years. Let's just be honest. They were bad. AEW comes along. All of a sudden, they start kicking into gear. It's like the no competition thing. People are going to say it's not true, or it, 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 but it is true. When you don't have competition, you're just lackadaisical. Vince just rests on his laurels. Ah, we'll bring in this guy once in a while, and ah, we'll pop a little rating here. But they consistently were terrible for 20 years. They did not have like a long string like they had when WCW was around and you had the Attitude Era. It was almost like a, a downfall. AEW comes all of a sudden back on the upswing. So we need AEW. They need to be successful. They need to be on TV. We all knew, like, we all knew that AEW was going to do this. We hoped it would. We hoped AEW would, because, dude, like, those years of WWE, like, what, 2013, 2018, 2019, oh. 20, till the quarantine, just brutal stuff. And unfortunately for me, that's when my son got into wrestling and we were going to all these WrestleManias. It was just brutal stuff. Uh, we knew from past that and just you know like if you own a like my music school man let me tell you if a music school opens up next door i'm gonna pick up my game no matter how good i think i am now it's just pure psychology and at the same time aw has been great for wrestling in so many ways jobs jobs basic jobs also pay like not just jobs but when you have, le do you think Charlotte Flair would have got the money she got if AEW didn't exist? Do you think Sasha would be asking for the money she's asking if AEW didn't exist? Just even CM Punk coming back, or Cody or whoever, it's because AEW exists. It, it, Tony Khan has benefited the wrestling world for generations by bringing this company in, and could it be done better? Absolutely. I don't want to sound like him, but yes, better decisions could be made to make it more successful. Absolutely. But it's been a creative impetus. Vince would probably still be there if AEW didn't exist. Really? Wow. Interesting. It just seems like with the infusion of Triple H and, and Vince kind of, you know, stepping off to the air, I feel like that has helped business, too, because people are like, oh, it's fresh. It's new. We got a better booker. Or we got somebody, you know, more in line with what we like. Is So I feel Triple H, that's like the perfect storm for him, too, to be there. there yeah, and there's no need to make the change if there's AEW, right? Like, right. how do you know? You know, people, you know, even back then in 2017, 18, 16, people were like, oh, you guys are too critical. Oh, you guys, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, this is terrible. Um, you know, it's it's hard to see it until you see have another company nipping at your heels. Triple H is just, you know, he wasn't that giving a wrestler, you know? Like, he wasn't, no. you know, really? like, we talk about, I don't know, what was it, 21 seconds it took him to cover Booker T? after his his uh um his pedigree pedigree yeah oh. and then RVD and some other cases where he just decided I'm not going to give this guy the rub Triple H man it's kind of cool if you think about it. Triple H the wrestler was in self survival mode trying to promote himself the best Triple H the executive is trying to make that company good so he's applying all those things he did for himself to everybody else I have not heard nary a complaint an underhanded comment, a leak, anything negative about Triple H. You know, I know Dax and them, they never felt they were Triple H guys, you know, but they never particularly felt disrespected by him or treated, uh, you know, you know, they didn't get, they don't get yelled at for sneezing anymore. You know, like it's, it's a whole different culture. And I think with the, uh, with the, with the um, TKO taking over, uh, Vince, even though I said he could, he'd probably still be there. It's a harder situation to be in now for a Vince McMahon to kind of run amok doing the things he wants to do. And bless uh, Khan, Nick Khan, for saying, okay, I'm in charge, but Triple H's job is creative. And guess who's staying out of creative? That's like getting Whitey Herzog as your manager, Earl Weaver as your manager, and saying, okay, Earl, Earl Weaver's a better example because he's going to platoon everybody to hell. And the general manager can't, can't tell him what to do. Earl's going to do what, he, what he's going to put John Singleton and, and, you know, Eddie Murray in, and he's going to switch up 
catchers, and the general manager stays out of it because he hired the right manager for the job. Right. Definitely. It just seems like with Triple H is in there, even like the ill will with Punk is gone. I know Randy Orton and him used to bump heads. It doesn't seem like that. Uh, obviously, Cody broke that th- the, the, uh, the whatever you call it, the throne or whatever. So you think there might be some heat there. There obviously is none. Like Cody loves him. Scott Steiner was just in the Hall of Fame. He loves him. You know what I mean? It just seems like, wow, what the hell? This guy uh, is so much different than the Triple H I kind of grew up watching and, you know, quote unquote, burying people. It's very interesting. It's kind of like, you know, once in a while, you'll see a Supreme Court justice who doesn't rule the, on a case based on their political ideology. They rule what's best for the court. You know, we, I've seen that a few times, like John Roberts has done that a couple of times where you go, oh, wow, he didn't rule the way we thought we would. He ruled because he wanted to protect the sanctity of the court. And that's a that's a pretty big analogy. And so um, Triple H is kind of the same way where you think he's going to be a certain way, but it seems like all of his decisions are made for the glory of the company and not for himself, which is a beautiful way to be, you know, like he's really, and he also takes care of his friends. Don't get me wrong. Like he takes care of his friends, but he really does a good job. I loved uh, NXT uh, uh, black and gold. I just thought it was my favorite is one of my favorite eras of wrestling ever. And he, he, he ran that, you know, they were good back then, uh, for sure. Now, I mean, now they're coming along, I guess, with with Michaels, but it's probably Triple H's vision, I guess, in in some respect, with what whatever they're doing down there. I'm sure, right? I, I think I'm guessing Triple H would run it the way he's been run, where it's it's Shawn Michaels' deal. You know, it's not for me yet. Like I don't love. I try. I I want to, but man, it was just so cool back then. Like I'm talking right when like Kevin Owens, Finn Balor, and um and Kenta got signed. Like that was a, and Sami Zayn was just freaking killing it. And just, it was such a cool atmosphere. And every week you'd have some new guy you'd have to learn about. And he was good. He was good. You know, this is much more developmental. So, you know, I have less interest in watching guys learn how to wrestle than I did in discovering about new badasses I'm watching. Now we'll hit the wind down. We'll head towards the finish here. We'll keep your your voice. We'll keep it nice uh, intact. I know you're not 100. percent But let's just say favorite. We'll do some quick hitters. Like favorite promotion right now that you enjoy. Uh, favorite promotion right now that I enjoy is. It's tough. I like AEW Collision, and I like WWE Raw. But but I fast forward a lot through Raw, so I still am going to go with AEW by a hair. But man, WWE is catching up. It's just that three-hour show. Yeah, I, I actually found out today I have strep throat. So like, I am, oh, I am. Yeah, it's it, it's fine. I feel good now. But I was dying earlier. But I'd say AW by hair. All-time favorite promotion. Oh wow, that's tough. So I'm old. So I'm a Crockett guy, and I'm a world-class guy. And so I grew up in Southern California. In Southern California, man, like we got cable, and I could watch like eight. 10 12 hours of wrestling a weekend like and i loved it from california championship wrestling which was like a terrible indie to polynesian pacific pro wrestling which was like uh the rocks moms thing you know mid-south crockett world class came in every week i love world class old wwe i have to say if i had to pick one that 85 crockett era love that oh good stuff did you see the iron claw I have not seen it yet, but I have a plot. My employee and friend Jimmy is not a wrestling fan. So I'm taking him to see Iron Claw, but I'm not telling him anything about it. So he's going to think it's this feel-good wrestling movie. And as these guys die one at a time, he's going to just spin out as I watch. It's going to be hilarious. And then after it, i got to say, there was another guy who killed himself too, Jimmy. Like, it's... (laughs) Man, it's like, how bad is your story... If you have to like cut a suicide out of the story because it makes it too tragic, like how bad is that story? Like, oh my, those poor Von Erichs. Watching that shit in real, excuse me, watching that stuff in real time was crazy. And then one week, I'll tell you this: one week, I watched Chris Adams get blinded by Gino Hernandez on TV. Right, that was the big angle. Gino Hernandez turned on Chris Adams. They're both bad guys. Blinded. Two days later in the paper, I read Gino Hernandez is dead. 
And then the next week, they have the follow-up with Gino Hernandez on TV because it's like two or three weeks behind, you know? World class, man. They had some great stuff, but man, what a tragic story. Yeah, the, the movie I thought was great, but obviously I know it's not historically accurate. Even some of the wrestling stuff not historically accurate, but I'm okay with it because there's the dramatization, and Kevin was okay with it, so. And, and man, Carrie is so tiny, though, man. It's it's hard for me to imagine. Yeah, that, that throws me off because yeah. the real Carrie Von Erich is 6'3", 275 pounds, like Greek god, looks literally like he's from, like, another planet, and this guy is a good actor, but he's very small. And exciting in the ring, man. Like, Carrie was a mess. If you listen to Ric Flair, Carrie was never, like, straight like never ever straight in the ring but man when he used to hop in that ring and circle around and start hopping and start punching and the place would just go crazy carry was the man like i was really glad when i saw him in wwe or wbf as the texas tornado i would remember watching that uh saturday night's main event and being like oh cool oh he's the texas tornado little did i know he had one foot yeah crazy yeah, yeah crazy Oof, god bless crazy. Kevin on eric Oh, man. Just amazing that he's that good an athlete on one foot and does the discus punch. It's like, holy crap, this guy. Is Dude, he, he was really good. Like, he, I think he was up for the Rocky Four part, I think, like the, the Drago part, mm -hmm. I believe. And, like, his whole life could have turned out differently. But kids, drugs and alcohol, they're just like, you never know. Some people can do some drugs and they can walk away. Other people can do drugs and it's their life forever. And poor Carrie Von Eric is one of those life forever guys. And it just ended up taking this beautiful career and this star and honestly the crown jewel of the Von Eric family and just yeah. taking him down a, just a dark road. And, you know, just, and it happened to a lot, man, because those painkillers, that's basically heroin. And when you're giving people heroin, they're going to get addicted. And poor Carrie, you know, it, it might have been very different if it happened today. Now, um, not wrestling related. Give me a favorite TV show of all time and a recommendation of a show to watch now. Uh, let's see. So I'll, yeah, I guess I'll go with The Wire. I love The Wire. Um, I don't know. Have you watched The Wire at all? Oh, yeah. Yep. The Wire is fantastic. Great show. Yep. It's great. Um, you know, just the characterizations and like, you know, the it's such a clever show because it shows you the police organization and the criminal organization at the exact same time running in parallel and about how they're pretty much just screwed up and it's pretty much the same thing. Nothing changes. Life yep. is pointless. Right. Um, so I don't know about now what's on now, but I just finished watching snowfall. Have you seen snowfall? No. Is that FX. It's great. Snowfall is is a I guess it's a little bit like The Wire because it it it's uh, centered around African American characters and the drug cartel and the drug trade, but it's about the '80s and the '90s where crack became an epidemic in Los Angeles, and it it, it follows this one character who kind of just invents crack, you know, and um, it had six seasons. It's uh it's dark, it's crazy, great acting great uh, characterizations so i would highly recommend snowfall oh wow okay i love recommendations on the tv shows i'm gonna have to check that out also by the way uh the wire when stringer bell dies wasn't happy about this my favorite character on the show was not happy about that one but Sorry stringer, to spoil man, it for anybody. like <laughs> stringer's like man he just was a little condescending like he didn't really know that much like you think like he oh, literally he's totally something... being a phony yeah 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 it's 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 a, like for me i really uh um McNulty is a character oh, awesome, yeah. I am like, like I, I, I'm very indignant and I will go down with a ship for doing what I think is right. Even if it's so stupid, you know, and there's one scene, sorry, folks, there's one scene where Freeman says to McNulty he goes, what are you gonna do when this is all over McNulty? You think there's going to be a whole Jimmy was right parade? How's this end? And McNulty goes, I don't know, man, like another case. And Freeman goes, you got to find something more than this right here. And that's how I feel about my job. Like, I'm so into it that I don't really care and I don't see the end result. And it's just a deep show. I love that scene. Uh, I love the show. So many good characters. Bunk and uh, Omar and uh, Omar, Clay Davis yeah. is awesome. Yeah, there's so many good characters. Yeah, I have a poster in my uh, my living room of The Wire, like a giant movie poster of it. I'm a big, 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 big fan. Good show. I'm a child, awesome. basically. I have movie posters in my living room, so. Nice, nice. Uh, favorite movie? What do you, what do you got for movie? Okay, so movie. 
I like a gladiator a lot. You know, I'm a dude, you know, so have you seen Gladiator? Oh, yeah. Russell Crowe. Oh, it's fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, the scene where he reveals himself, you know, uh, to, to Commodus, and he says, father of a murdered child, uh, husband to a slain wife, and I will get my revenge in this life or the next. Oh, my God. Just inject it in my veins. That's a well, great, that's a dude movie. Great movie. Great choice. Love that movie. Thank you. Have you ever seen uh, The Usual Suspects? Have you ever seen that movie? Love The Usual Suspects. Love, I love movies with, uh, with surprise endings, but I'm known as someone who loves movies with like sad endings. Anything sad at the end, I'm for. Flowers for Algernon, love it. I don't know if you remember Flowers for Algernon. But, no. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Rogue One, oh my God, perfect. Yes. Fight Club, perfect. Give me something where everybody dies at the end, and I am, that's, that's, I'm in. You know, oh, Infinity War, perfect. I could have just left it right there. You know, like, yes. you know, so, uh, yeah, for sure, for sure. Now, before we let you go, tell us where everybody can find you, what you're up to, Wrestling Inc., the music school, if you're doing any more themes, everything you got going on. Well, I have, for the first time in many years, decades, created some music, just original music, and I'm actually singing, which you can't tell from hearing me now, but you can look it up on Spotify under Matt Kuhn, K-O-O-N, or Apple Music, or Amazon Music, wherever you get your music. I have three songs that are recorded right here where I'm sitting. Um, I am on Wrestling Inc. on occasion. Um, unfortunately, one of my wrestling themes just went bye-bye this week, unfortunately, because oh. my theme for Deanna Perazzo for Impact is no longer for oh. Deanna is with um, uh, AEW and uh, bless Deanna. She gave me a lot of work. She gave me a lot of referrals, including Steve Macklin. So if you hear Steve Macklin's theme, that's mine. Um, not too much music these days, but I will say, and of course, Wrestling Inc., I will say it's very hard to keep me away from podcasting. So I would say by the end of 2024, I'll be back with something that people will love and hate and be talking about. 